from renewable sources. Every project selected by the EU ensures that it minimizes the overall impact on wildlife and the environment. But that is not all. These projects build bridges between countries and distribute energy more efficiently. As a result, isolated and peripheral member states will be better integrated into the European energy market. Are you interested in these projects? Get involved now and play an active role. People working in industry can reduce their environmental impact by sharing good practices and cooperating closely with civil society. Let's work together and move towards secure, sustainable and affordable energy sources for all consumers. Join and help us modernise and better connect Europe's energy infrastructure. Projects of common interest are major infrastructure facilities that connect energy networks across Europe, ensuring that secure, clean and affordable energy reaches all citizens. They will make it possible to complete the European internal energy market and meet the EU's objective of secure, sustainable and affordable energy. New infrastructure means new electricity lines, gas pipelines, high voltage electric systems and much more. PCIs, projects of common interest, help energy travel more efficiently over land, underground or underwater, increasing energy exchange across countries and regions. These exchanges allow energy providers to compete with one another, offering consumers the best price. The projects of common interest boost the use of energy from renewable sources. Every project selected by the EU ensures that it minimizes the overall impact on wildlife and the environment. But that is not all. These projects build bridges between countries and distribute energy more efficiently. As a result, isolated and peripheral member states will be better integrated into the European energy market. Are you interested in these projects? Get involved now and play an active role. People working in industry can reduce their environmental impact by sharing good practices and cooperating closely with civil society. Let's work together and move towards secure, sustainable and affordable energy sources for all consumers. Join and help us modernise and better connect Europe's energy infrastructure. Projects of common interest are major infrastructure facilities that connect energy networks across Europe, ensuring that secure, clean and affordable energy reaches all citizens. They will make it possible to complete the European internal energy market and meet the EU's objective of secure, sustainable and affordable energy. New infrastructure means new electricity lines, gas pipelines, high voltage electric systems and much more. PCIs, projects of common interest, help energy travel more efficiently over land, underground or underwater, increasing energy exchange across countries and regions. These exchanges allow energy providers to compete with one another, offering consumers the best price. The projects of common interest Hello. boost the use of energy Hello. from renewable Hello. sources. Hello. Every project selected by the EU ensures that it minimizes the overall impact on wildlife and the environment. But that is not all. These projects build bridges between countries and distribute energy more efficiently. As a result, isolated and peripheral member states will be better integrated into the European energy market. Are you interested in these projects? Get involved now and play an active role. People working in industry can reduce their environmental impact by sharing good practices and cooperating closely with civil society. Let's work together and move towards secure, sustainable and affordable energy sources for all consumers. Join and help us modernise and better connect Europe's energy infrastructure. Projects of common interest are major infrastructure facilities that connect energy networks across Europe, ensuring that secure, clean and affordable energy reaches all citizens. They will make it possible to complete the European internal energy market and meet the EU's objectives. Uh, good evening, everyone. Could you take your seats because we're going to start the next session. You've had a wonderful day, but it's not over yet. There's even more to come. Uh, always uh, very nice to be here with such an enthusiastic crowd. So what I propose to do, I'm Megan Richards, I'm the Director of Energy Policy in DG Energy, 
And uh, what I propose to do is call up the panelists one after the other, and then we can begin. I'll make a couple of introductory remarks very briefly, and then we can start the discussion, and I expect there will be a very rich and thorough exchange uh, with you as well. So the first of our panelists is Clara Poletti, who's the chairwoman of ACER, who's our European Regulatory Board. Whoops, yeah, I'm looking, at, looking the wrong way, of course. So welcome, please come and have a seat and give her a round of applause. So. And the next is Eva Pagan, who's Director General for Transmission, Red Electrica de España. Welcome. So you see from the south, we have good gender representation. Very good. And from <laughs> Vincent Touvenin, who's the Director of European Affairs, Réseau de Transport d'Electricité. Please come and have a seat. Then Valdemar Lagoda, who's Deputy Director of Energy, Ministry of Energy in Poland. I haven't had a chance to say hello. Please come and have a seat. And it is, oh my goodness. I'll probably say it wrong. It's got a lot of little uh, marks to tell me how to pronounce it, but I'm not going to. Seishan, will you say it? Yeah, Seishan, you're fine. Seishan. Anyway, you can read it in your, <laughs> in your, welcome, very nice to see you. Um, Edis is the Director of Energy and Infrastructure at the Ministry of Economics in Latvia. And then we have Janusz Uyga, who's an expert in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications Estonia. Welcome, thank you for coming. And uh, Thomas Sipus, Head of Regulatory Affairs at Acon Smart Grids. Welcome, please. Have a seat. So I'm very pleased to be here today to moderate this discussion uh, focusing on the success stories of our trans-European energy infrastructure and of course the PCI label in particular. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel today. All of these participants have shown a great proof of solidarity and cooperation and have contributed in one way or another to making these projects of common interest a great success. And I understand, I haven't had a chance yet, but I understand you can go and have a look at some of these wonderful examples in the PCI garden, so I encourage you to do that if you haven't done it uh, already. You've heard it already a number of times today, and I'm sure you will hear it again this evening, that our grid is facing pressures of the fast-paced energy transition, the energy transformation is here, it's coming, and the PCIs can make this particularly happen. Uh, what we want to do, of course, in the electricity sector is integrate renewables even faster and better, and that's why our new market design legislation helps to push this forward, as well as introducing even more consumer protection and consumer participation in the electric grids, and of course gas will still have a very important role, at least over the short term, for offsetting the variability of renewables and of course for replacing coal. So we still see the need for these changes and going forward to push forward the energy transition. So this transformation is making the implementation of the key PCIs all the more important and it's urgent to take full advantage of the increasing amount of renewable generation being fed into the system. You've heard probably about the proposal to have new renewable PCIs as well. We want to, of course, reduce the vulnerabilities of certain regions and increase their security of supply. Security of supply being the number one uh, aspect of the energy union. The, number, the first of the many principles, the five, principles of the energy union. And the other aspect that these PCIs can do is of course tap into the potential of digitalization and low carbon technologies to revamp traditional grids. And here we see a lot of potential with the smart grid PCIs and of course the CCS uh, PCIs as well. And we think that in the context of the long-term strategy for greenhouse gas emissions, which I'm sure many of you have seen, you will have seen that the role of CCS will probably be important in the future to offset the very last bits of um, reduction of uh, carbon in the system. So cross-border infrastructure projects are inherently complex. You know that very well. We've put in place a policy that addresses this complexity, but also creates a stable and predictive framework. 
for promoters, regulators, authorities, and civil society to interact in an orderly manner. And the projects with a PCI label enjoy enhanced regulatory and political support, and of course, streamlined procedures throughout their implementation. So apart from this um, stable legislative support, the Commission also has put in place high-level groups to discuss key regional projects and enhance the strategic steering at all levels, technical, operational, and political. And I want to add as well that we have additional regional, special regional cooperation on PCIs and pushing for the uh, participation also in cross-border, beyond European border uh, actions, because this is another important element of our security of supply uh, policy, but also making sure our internal energy market works even better and even more effectively. So, what is the key to success? We know that some projects have it, some are not as successful as others. What I would like to see from you is what you think are the real key elements to making a PCI work well. How can we turn all our projects into great successes, ensure that the energy union uh, becomes even more successful in the future? And we have, of course, here representatives of the Biscay Bay interconnector between Spain and France, which was, once it will be completed by 2025, it will double the interconnection capacity and integrate the entire Iberian Peninsula into the internal electricity market, so a very important element for the internal um, energy market and, of course, for security of supply. Ministries of two of the three Baltic states and Poland, who will talk about synchronization project of the Baltic states and the continental European network. The synchronization of the Baltic states with the continental European network is a flagship project of the Energy Union that's reached a landmark on the 28th of June last year when leaders of the three Baltic states, Poland and the Commission, signed a political roadmap agreeing on how to implement the synchronization by 2025. You know that that synchronization was important to move the Baltic states away from their previous connections with Russia, probably. And the Acon Smart Grids, one of the four smart grid projects on the PCI list, is connecting the Czech and Slovak markets. And Acon is an example of a highly re respected future grid in synergy with uh, the distribution network. So we'll also hear from the European regulator about the last piece of the puzzle, which is regulatory support. So what I will do now is um, start first with Clara, and perhaps since we ended with the regulatory aspects, we'll start now with the regulatory issues first. Perhaps you can give us an idea, Clara, of what you think the really important elements are of making the PCIs successful. And you can either speak from here or from there. And that will give me a chance to find my watch. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to, to be here. Uh, the, uh, the session is about uh, successful stories on uh, cross-border cooperation. I might say that ACER per se is a successful story of cooperation. So this is a very good starting point. Uh, cooperation uh, must be grounded on uh, specific tools and mechanisms. That's very important. And if I look to the PCI regulation, I see two tools that uh, are uh, relevant, very relevant I want to mention. One is the cost-benefit analysis, and the other one is the cross-border cost allocation mechanism. Of course, the first one is, is no new. It's, it's something that economists and um, policymakers have known for a long time, but the way it is used in the PCI framework is completely different because here we are making an attempt to harmonize a methodology to give a, a monetary value to cost and benefits both in electricity and gas infrastructures. So using the same measure or at least a harmonized measure for all Europe. This is very important because cost-benefit analysis is not an end per se, but a, it is a useful tool to uh, analyze and, and to understand which factors are more relevant and have a bigger impact on uh, the value of a project. 
So it's a, it's a starting point for a, a common understanding of that uh, project. Of course, uh, ESER has published uh, many opinions and recommendations on uh, those methodologies. Uh, on, uh, on gas, a new methodology uh, has just been approved uh, on electricity and for gas a new version has been sent to the European Commission for approval. So it's a, it's a I would say a work in progress is not easy and uh, there are uh, challenges that still need to be addressed. One challenge is transparency. Uh, in um, in its recommendation, ACER has often underlined the necessity to make the modeling more uh, transparent uh, in uh, uh, such a way as to allow stakeholders uh, to have a proper understanding of, of what is driving uh, the result. And this is the only way to have a balanced and, and uh, open uh, debate about uh, PCIs. The second challenge is scenario building. Elaborating a long-term vision of the future energy developments is a fundamental responsibility. And uh, in particular, ACER and NRAs are uh, requesting uh, that uh, conservative or so-called behind the target scenarios are kept in, uh, uh, within the possible uh, uh, storylines uh, in order to uh, ensure a balanced representation of, of the future. Uh, and that's necessary in order to evaluate uh, the interconnection uh, projects. And finally, the assessment of positive externalities, uh, such as security of supply and even uh, the value of CO2 cuts remain complex and debated. And there, the effort should be to really give a monetary value to externalities as well. Uh, the overall process uh, of uh, the, the PCI evaluation is strictly linked to the assessment of future scenarios, as we all know. And uh, uh, the development, the process of developing a uh, 10-year um, network development plan, integrating electricity and gas here is very important. We have been used to thinking that electricity uh, is one word and uh, gas is the other word. Uh, of course, the regulation was sort of... Uh, uh, forward-looking enough to foresee that an integrated assessment of scenarios, but now things are getting even more integrated with the so-called sector coupling, with the new technologies. It's going to be very difficult to keep the two words separated. It is very important that we manage to have a, a common view, taking both into account. The second uh, mechanism is, uh, is the cost-benefit cost allocation. This is very important from the uh, regulatory perspective because it allows um, an alignment between uh, the interest of project developers and uh, the interest of the different countries that are involved. Uh, the ESER has published a status review report uh, that has some very interesting results that give us a measure of how relevant uh, uh, PCIs are in terms of uh, investments. Uh, 30 investment requests resulted in CBA, CBCA decisions adopted by other NRAs, 28 by NRAs, and two instances by the agency. And the main findings are that uh, 20 decisions were made for gas and 10 for electricity. However, this difference between electricity and gas has been relevant, at the, especially at the beginning of the period. Now, uh, the, the two sectors are more uh, leveled. And uh, uh, 14 uh, decisions were taken in 2014 alone. And now we are at a point where we have a relatively steady stream or four to six decisions per year. 12 decisions were adopted for PCIs belonging to the Baltic Energy Market Interconnection Plan, Electricity and Grass Priority Corridors. 70% of the decisions uh, are PCI located in only one country, 
when we talk about cross-border, while 30% were for interconnectors. Overall, the investment costs for the project exceeded the uh, 12 billions, uh, more um, on the gas side than in the electricity side. The, uh, let me just close uh, with a, a final remark and look at the future. Uh, the um, project of common interest are intended to the, uh, reflect the European energy policy priorities. Uh, and uh, uh, I personally think that it should be, could be advisable to extend the selection scope of the projects uh, dedicated to green gas as well to gas electricity integration in the context of the power to gas in particular. So looking at the future, we should adjust the scope in order to include even this new technological development. But this is something that has been mentioned before in the introduction as well. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Clara. Um, of course, the governance regulation has introduced, of course, these new national integrated climate and energy plans as well. And so the development of PCIs in that context will also be interesting as well, I think. Good. So that's the view from the regulator. Eva, can I ask you to come up and speak? Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, we are going to present uh, Van Sand and, and myself a story of success, a success story, which starts uh, almost 40 years ago. And I, I will try to, to explain with, with the same, we will try to explain why are we saying that. Um, we are RTE and Red Electrica, um, the TSOs of Spain and France. Uh, you see there in the middle in Elfed, which is a joint venture that we will explain you. This is the vehicle we have used to, to construct interconnections. Let's talk uh, first about the institutional cooperation framework. Wow, it's hard. Everybody can tell me where is the, okay, that's one, this way. <laughs> okay, I, I was starting to say uh, how were the Spain, France interconnection? As you can see, we have in the title the long story. Of course, it's a long story. It was 1982 when we started to try with uh, our colleagues in France to construct a new interconnection to uh, go up with this 1.4 percentage of interconnection level that we had uh, with the rest of Europe. During, uh, you see, more than 20 years, it was uh, nearly impossible to advance and to, to, to clarify if it was possible to build new interconnections. It was in 2008 where due to the strong opposition, Mr. Monti was nominated as a coordinator that after a consultation recommends an exceptional solution for to building an interconnection between France and Spain. This uh, exceptional solution was to, to build an underground line through the Pyrenees in HBDC, which is the project Santa Lugaya Baixas uh, that now is in service. In 2018, Eight, it was also the intergovernmental between France and Spain agreement of Saragossa confirms what Mr. Monti was proposing. And we started to, to think that it was possible to build a new interconnection uh, between France and Spain. It was in 2011 that the European Fund is in support for the project uh, uh, with a loan agreement of uh, 350 million and European grant of 225 million. During the next years, we were working hard for joint interconnection and it was 
in 2015 that we had the Madrid Declaration. It was signed between the France, Portugal, and Spain submit with a common declaration that it was pointed out the uh, underlined importance of mobilizing all the necessary efforts to increase electricity interconnection, not only thinking in the project that it was going to put in service this year, but also thinking in the next decades. And in 2015, we had also the signature of the Memorandum of Understanding, establishing what it was mentioned before, uh, a high-level group for the Southwest Europe. And we have to say this kind of high-level meetings with the European Commission, with the NREAs, with the ministries and the TSOs have helped us a lot to clarify which was the, the real objective for building and develop new interconnections. It was in October 2015 that it was possible the commission of the new interconnection between Santa Gregoria Baixas and it was possible to achieve the 2.8% of interconnection level between the two countries. All the, the support from the ministries, from the government, from the commission, it was possible that last year in Lisbon, it was signed the Lisbon Energy during the energy uh, interconnection submit, the signatories recalled the commitment to develop the new interconnections with all the uh, support from all the, 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 the actors that do impossible. Uh, how have we done this? Well, in the cooperation framework be between Breath Electrica and RTE has been always uh, great. But we have a common vehicle in charge of building new interconnection, which is in Elfe. I will tell you some, some uh, figures about in Elfe which is a joint venture that it always, we have celebrated last year, and uh, Katrina was there also, for the 10 years of the, um, of the company. In Elfe was created in October 2008 with, uh, as a joint venture, a French company with, uh, with a mix and an equal RTE and REE teams in charge of building new interconnections. At the beginning, in charge of building Santa Yogaya Baixas interconnection, and now responsible for the interconnection of the Biscay Gulf. As you can see there, the choice of uh, incorporated joint venture, we have to tell you that it has, it has been perfect because it's a formal commitment from the project promoters, it's auditability and a transparent decision-making process, and the visibility and concrete expression of the TSO cooperations. Uh, the day-by-day -day cooperation as we are working now with the Biscay Gulf uh, project is uh, allow us to have coherent technical choices and decisions uh, with an effective management code, cost and, and deadlines and improved management of the skill requirements. And of course, share experience between the two companies. Uh, the, the story is in Elf. I think the, first, the, the, the best way to explain it is, is through the, the examples of the project that Vincent will explain. Thank you, Eva. So, yeah, it works. Um, yeah, I will try to uh, give some insight of uh, the fruits of uh, the cooperation explained by Eva. Um, uh, it's a new line that has been uh, commissioned in 2015 and we call Baixa Santa Logaya. If you look at the picture, it might uh, give a better understanding. It's a line that is near, comes from nearby Perpignan to Figueres in northern Catalonia. So it w this line is breaking a number of records and um, it's doubling the capacity, uh, the existing capacity at that time uh, between Spain and France. Uh, from 1.4 gigawatt to 2.8 uh, gigawatts. It's a project of common interest in the framework of that time. It's been commissioned in 2015, so it's four years uh, uh, from now that it's, it's in service. But just to recall the number of records, uh, the records if, if it broke, um, I would just uh, use three words. It's uh, uh, mountain, technology, and tariff, and cost. So the mountain, because it's crossing the Pyrenees, it's a sensitive area on environmental grounds, and so the choice of an underground cable has been um, uh, made at that time under the, the, uh, the guidance of Mr. Monti, as uh, recalled by, by Eva. 
It's a 65 kilometer uh, long line uh, th that was uh, recorded at that time at the power level of uh, two uh, gigawatts uh, line of uh, capacity in direct current um, uh, technology. Uh, it's also, it was also a, a new record uh, in the technology of XLPE that was used for, for this line, but uh, anyway, this is for, I guess, experts of technologies. Uh, of course, it has two converter stations at its, each side of, the, of this uh, direct current lines to connect with the alternative current grid, and that, that it, it was the first time that uh, a current, uh, um, direct current line ran in parallel with an alternative current line uh, on, on uh, the, the both um, uh, side of the network. Um, the, the cost of the investment uh, was uh, 700 million euro, which is uh, quite important and expensive line, um, given the technological choice um, that was necessary in the exceptional circumstances to have a public support and public acceptance for that line. Then to show you what are um, the, what look like uh, the, the construction line of such a, an infrastructure. It's a big infrastructure, in fact. It crosses 8.5 kilometers of tunnels through the mountains. Uh, you have a picture of that tunnels on the upper uh, left of the picture. Um, you can see the, the machines to build the, to, um, build the tunnels on the um, lower left of the picture and the rest is about the substations and the cable underground, but you see it's uh, not uh, a small infrastructure, so it's really necessary to take care of how it is inserted in the environment and uh, to get to public acceptance. In terms of benefits now, after one year, uh, it's the figures I have uh, now available, after one year of uh, um, operation, um, just uh, for you to, to have a, um, an understanding of the reduction of the congestion level at the border, you just have to look at the pink um, uh, part of the, of the cycle. So it's decreasing from uh, 72% to 61% in one sense of uh, the exchange, meaning, uh, I guess, France to Spain. This is mainly the, the most... Uh, um, the, the figures that show the best in the, uh, on, on this diagram, of course, uh, the less congested area, the less congested period of time, sorry, uh, during the year are increasing and this is good for the exchange and this is good for price and this is good for uh, the Spanish and, and Portuguese system to be less isolated from the European system. Now, I guess to the, to the next project we are uh, working on at the moment, it's Biscay Gulf Interconnector. It's a submarine interconnector. The objective is to double the capacity again at the, bo uh, at the border of France and Spain, to go, to go up to five gigawatts, uh, um, uh, at least uh, when, when the, the network is, uh, is uh, fully operational. Um, this increase is not a, a, a little increase uh, for the system um, uh, consideration and stability, and we have to be sure that uh, this works properly with, uh, with the existing network. Um, it will be uh, um, an interconnector 370 kilometers long, of which 280 kilometers will be submarine cable in direct current technology, and it will have a capacity of uh, two gigawatts uh, again. So most of the interconnector is submarine. It's a technical challenge. We have to go through submarine uh, a canyon on the French uh, coast, and uh, meaning that uh, the uh, drilling uh, um, facility has to be uh, um, uh, considered, and uh, it's a really a challenge on technological side. Uh, it, the choice has been made to connect two powerful nodes on the national grids, ma mainly the Bordeaux area, to the Bilbao area. This choice, uh, linking the two nodes by submarine cables, avoids to have a strong reinforcement needs on the national networks if we would have uh, gone on a, a smaller uh, scale uh, interconnector linking the two uh, uh, national network uh, just on the side of the mountains. It would have needed um, strong reinforcement and this technology, this choice uh, can avoid that and have a, a better um, uh, in, um, environmental integration and local integration of this, uh, this project. Uh, 
um, when we focus on the um, time scale development of the project, um, it comes back to 2013 when uh, we had the declaration of, uh, the, of the project of common interest for the Gulf of Biscay. In September 2017, is more closer to us, the Spanish and French regulatory agencies reached an agreement for the development of the project, and it was a cost-benefit analysis and cross-border cost allocation that Mrs. Poletti mentioned earlier. It's an example. And in July 2018, we had the signature in Lisbon of a European grant agreement of uh, uh, more than uh, 500 million, one third of the co estimated cost of the project uh, to, to support the project. Maybe I, I forgot to mention that uh, Baisha Santa Logala line also had the support of uh, the European fundings uh, around 225 million euro, uh, showing uh, how that the, the European Commission, the European institution, considers these projects providing benefits at European level as well. Um, in Elfe, the joint venture between RTE and Rail Electrica is in charge of the procurement process for the main contracts and will supervise the construction of the lines, and when it's commissioned, the lines will get back to the propriety of RTE and Rail Electrica on each side of the border. Um, and now we are in the phase of uh, impact study and public information until mid-2020 before going into procurement. Key factor of success uh, for uh, such uh, uh, PCI projects, uh, it's a point of view that we can give. It's a strong commitment from uh, the European Commission, member states, regulator, TSOs, which relies on a clear assessment of the economic efficiency of the project and also cost sharing reflecting the distribution of the expected benefits in each country, CBCA process. Another uh, factor of success is the cohesive and supportive project management, and uh, we think that uh, INELFE is a really interesting uh, vehicle for this cohesive and supportive uh, management by uh, an incorporated uh, joint venture organization. And last but not least, one guideline is to minimize the environmental impact of the projects by the technolo technological choices to seek solutions with stakeholders to reduce residual impact of the project on the environment, on local population. And we need continuous exchanges with local stakeholders. I get back to the Marine Declaration this morning. I guess it's one of the messages we get from that. It's also that we need a, a full alignment of the project promoters on both sides of the border because uh, local population are looking what, to what happens to the other part of the border. So we need to be very aligned as project promoters. And we need uh, responsiveness during the consultation process and exchange of good practices to show that we try to uh, move in the right direction. So thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, both Eva and Vincent. Um, that was very useful to have this, your overview and your assessment of what are the criteria for success. Um, I wanted to ask you, but really in one word, to give us an idea of what you think is more important in terms of the governance structure. You mentioned the joint venture, you mentioned day-to-day -day governance, you mentioned financing uh, from the EIB in one case and uh, European Commission as well. Which of those aspects do you think are the most important? You mentioned also commitment of all the stakeholders and uh, cost sharing, benefit sharing, etc., public uh, acceptance. But of those three aspects, the legal structure, the day-to-day -day governance and financing, is there one of those that you think is really primary? If, if, if you allow me to, to begin and uh, very shortly, to my understanding is to consider that there are different phases in a project. The time lead has to be really clearly defined when it is time for uh, consultation of the public and on, on environmental uh, stakeholders. When is it time for the regulator to intervene to say if they agree or do not agree to put part of the project or the full project in the tariffs because it's going through to the tariffs. So it's uh, supported then by the, the, the consumers at the end of the day and uh, when it is time to uh, manage the project uh, by uh, both company, and it's really a question of management, procurement process, have the same choices, must be aligned, and then the construction phase before commissioning, 
And not to forget, at the end of the day, we have to insert the project in the system, and it has to work, and to provide the capacity, and to be used the way it is uh, forecasted to be used. Yeah, yeah, I think I completely agree with with this. And this this kind of project, uh, they are such a big uh, complex, from the point of financial, uh, political, technical. We have been uh, mentioned before that. Uh, there are some uh, technical uh, uh, things that we have to deal with, and the coordination, depending on the phase, is necessary to, to be an So that close right. coordination, as you mentioned, is really important. Good, thank you very much. So let's go to the Baltics and Poland to talk about the synchronization uh, project of the Baltic states and continental European network. Um, Valdemar, can I ask you to uh, start off, uh, please? You can speak either from here or from the podium. Good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me, inviting Poland to, to this, uh, this panel to, to speak uh, on behalf of my ministry, how we do, do we see the synchronization. And because we are starting a short series of synchronous countries, I would like maybe, the, maybe uh, to, in, uh, to inform what is in fact the synchronization because we, have, we are also gas people here. So in Europe we have in general four or five synchronous area which are interconnected systems of, of, of uh, different member states, different countries also outside the U European Union which is covering, the system is covering uh, not only grids but also, also uh, generation units. And uh, synchronous area means that the, all of those generating units are working at the same synchronous, uh, s the same frequency, and, and all the of the moment of, of, of all the moments. And uh, I remember myself around three years ago when, when I was standing in, in beautiful building in Vilnius and was talking about energy security of Poland and also about the synchronizations. And I was asked. How do you f when do you think the synchronization is possible? And my answer was, well, is it, it would be a long story. It would be a long history when Baltic states can be synchronized be because of many reasons. Currently, the number of question marks are reduced to minimum, I guess, and uh, we are we hoping that synchronizations will be possible according to schedule 2025. But uh, starting from, uh, from the beginning, as you are may, maybe are aware, that energy security for Poland is, is a very important issue. And when it appears that uh, independence in terms of electricity generation of our Baltic neighbors is not very, very fast or very solid, and and, and security may be, may be in problems, we decided to uh, to, to change our approach. I mean to try to find the best approach for all member states and for all countries in the region, how to find the, the solution for synchronization. And so currently Poland is consistently starving to ensure the energy security of partners from, uh, from member states. And in fact, currently our TSO is playing a leading role in the process of preparation for uh, synchronization of uh, systems. Uh, and this readiness for uh, synchronization, we, treat, uh, we, we, we see it's a visi uh, visual sign of our regional solidarity that goes hand in hand with, with striving for energy security. So solidarity was mentioned several times today, so this is our, our example of, of how solidarity can work in the region. Uh, we, th we hope that uh, that uh, all uh, infrastructure projects which are necessary for, uh, for synchronization of Baltic states will obtain uh, the status of PCI projects. Fortunately, uh, we have now on the list, list number three of PCI's uh, general, general project related to synchronizations. Several of them are still missing and our, our uh, efforts are addressed to to insert also uh, Harmony Link, very nice name for the DC cable, insert this, this link uh, to the list. Um, our TSOs, I mean, uh, 
Polish TSO, PSC, and Midrig from Lithuania signed a uh, declaration on 21st of December. It was a preliminary agreement between those two TSOs regarding the project Harmony Link. And it is a significant step towards the implementation of synchronization. The question of today's panel is, uh, what, is the, what is the success? How the PCI projects can be, can be <coughs> finally realized? Uh, from our opinion, the success of bilateral and multilateral cooperation is in synchronization uh, infrastructure projects, especially in a, as complex as uh, synchronization, is conditioned by the openness, goodwill of all partners. On, of particular importance is the ability to look beyond the interests of one country for the benefit of the region. And uh, when uh, all of four countries and also Commission realized what is the, mm, the reality of the synchronizations, we, we start our uh, very solid steps ahead. A recent year was a very important year in, in terms of uh, success of, of synchronizations. We have told we we reached two documents: one on the level of, of prime ministers, the second is on the level of uh, ministers of four countries. And when the decision was taken that synchronization will be uh, realized to run e a, a, a AC line over the existing and the second line, which will be constructed the synchronization is on good path, I can say. And uh, one, 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 one more thing. We think that the main uh, promoter of synchronization is uh, Lithuanian side, side. When we finish construction, I mean we, we both countries finish construction of uh, lead polling, the, the, the AC or DC line between Poland and Lithuania, Lithuania going overhead on land, our partners ask us, let's try to build another line and let's synchronize both systems. Frankly speaking, it was very hard to achieve in those days because uh, the, the border between both countries, Poland and Lithuania, is around one kilometer long. And put two lines in the very short uh, area was very difficult. And another problem was, or another issue was, that uh, north, northwest of Poland, it's a very... Uh, attractive area in terms of, of uh, tourism. It is very, uh, very lo lots of lakes, lots, lots of, of, lots of uh, forests, and it was indeed very difficult to build even the first line. So the second line going under the sea is the best solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it is. Can we hear your, from your perspective how this works together? The cooperation between the different parties is obviously very important and the goodwill and the interests of each. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Commission, for inviting me to discuss here on this uh, important project, the uh, Baltic uh, Synchronization Project. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to discuss and share this information that we have reached in this project. Um, we have, uh, we have heard a lot of uh, times today in this event that uh, the Baltic synchronization project is really a key important uh, project. And uh, it's not a secret uh, as well from Baltic state perspective that uh, uh, this project is uh, very high on our energy priorities agenda. And uh, uh, I should say that there is a clear and justified reasons why it's so. And uh, it was also discussed before in the introductory part that uh, Unlike other EU member states, we still are uh, working in, the, our, in synchronous zone with uh, Russian power grid, uh, instead to be connected to EU uh, power grids. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's our great will uh, for, for long perspective is that uh, we want to become the full members of EU uh, energy, uh, energy market. And um, uh, most of you who are sitting in this uh, room uh, probably is aware that uh, what's the uh, Baltic synchronization project and when, when we are, where we are now. But I think that uh, only just uh, part of you knows the long history of this project. And uh, 
I would uh, like to share a little bit the brief history of all this project, how it started, and uh, the first uh, big uh, mm, major impulse was made in uh, late 20, uh, 2007, when the prime ministers of Baltic states uh, uh, prepared the joint communique, uh, where they called the TSOs from Baltic states to work towards uh, just to mm, understand and uh, evaluate feasibility of uh, the synchronous operation of uh, Baltic uh, energy systems with uh, Europe uh, power grids. And uh, since then, uh, this long-term journey, it was, of course, with a lot of uh, challenges and, uh, and a lot of obstacles uh, was uh, on our way. And uh, till, till that time, uh, I think that um, uh, this uh, good cooperation between all of uh, region partners together with a great support of this commission who was uh, from the beginning uh, supporting this project uh, really, really, and we, we uh, feel this uh, support from their side. And uh, I think that uh, we have came to the uh, logical, logical uh, uh, outcome from this, uh, all these studies. And together with all our partners and the commission, we have done a lot of researches uh, have overcome a lot of obstacles and have uh, seen a lot of challenges what was in the road, but uh, overall, uh, together we have uh, managed to, to overcome all these issues, and uh, I think that the t t at this moment the project is uh, going a really good, good, uh, good way forward, and it's on a track. And um, as I am here sp speaking in a such event, it's, uh, uh, it's a project of common interest day. I think that uh, this uh, this uh, instrument or this platform uh, it's uh, made, I think it's a, it was a essential accelerator for our project. Uh, how we, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, helped us to move forward to, with uh, our project and uh, overall it stipulates uh, the com uh, com complete of energy union and to, to reach this energy and climate goals of uh, all EU. Um, I could say that the projects of common interests are not only about improving uh, security and building interconnections. Uh, from my point of view, it uh, also includes promotion of constructive and deep cooperation between region partners, because only in the, uh, in the spirit of uh, this deep co uh, cooperation we can reach the target we want to reach. And um, I think that the big role in this whole project was for the Commission, for our partners when, uh, in, 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 in uh, this project, and the uh, Commission was uh, as a moderator between all of us regional partners, because of course uh, every of our countries have their interests and uh, so on, and it was, uh, uh, it was uh, I think, the result uh, from the great uh, inclusiveness of uh, Commission work also in this project, and we reached this uh, target and, uh, when this project is now on track. Um, and uh, one thing, what I, I just came to, to the end of my speech, I, I just uh, always, uh, if we talk about the context of energy security, uh, for me this is always a topical question. Uh, first one is, is it a response to the threats? Or we are, uh, or this, uh, it's a strategy to avoid the threats? And I think that the list of this project of common interests are the uh, significant part of EU long-term energy security strategy that uh, can also be seen as a preventive measures to avoid any threats that could come in the future. And um, I think that the good, uh, uh, good, uh, good, good thing was we, we all see uh, today in the morning or the midday that, uh, that there was the signing of the CEF agreement. I think it's a good sign that we can say that the project is on the track. Uh, we are moving according to time schedule, and uh, we hope that uh, during our this great and deep co cooperation between our region partners and with the great support of Commission, we will, at the end of the day, reach the, our main goal and we will be rewarded with the synchronization of Baltic states to energy uh, power grid systems by 2025. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and Janis, let's hear from the Estonian point of view how you see the Baltic grid. Um, we've heard about the importance of political support and the PCI status. Please, go ahead. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity of, of being here. Uh, 
I'm really glad that, that we are here and, and sharing this story. Um, I, I have to admit that there were darker days where, uh, where I didn't think that this signing of the, the grant agreement would happen, but uh, uh, thanks to cooperation, it, it did happen. But uh, <clears throat> we keep talking about cooperation, but maybe we should remind ourselves why we need cooperation. So there's an old saying that goes like this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So this is something that uh, I try to keep in mind throughout the process. Uh, obviously, it's, it's easier to do consultations with just one partner, yourself. I will do this. But to synchronize, to do a project of this scale, as, as uh, Edi said, it has, been a it has been in the political agenda from 2007. I, I, I have seen studies from the mid-1990s, uh, uh, almost right after we regained our independence and, and started driving towards EU. That we also uh, knew that eventually we need to synchronize the European networks as well. So this is not something that one country can do alone. It's, it's only something that we can do together. Obviously, there will be times where uh, the interests are different or, or we just don't understand each other. But the funny thing about uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania is that the, the, the length or, or the distance between the countries is, is rather small. I mean, 500 kilometers, maybe something more, but, but the languages are totally different. I can't understand any word that, <laughs> that the Latvians or Lithuanians are saying. So we have to use English, but obviously the national language of the European Union is, is bad English. So uh, sometimes, sometimes we, we misunderstand each other. So this is why uh, it's good to have someone who facilitates. And uh, the Commission has, has been kind enough to help us with that. Uh, I, I mean, they are already providing us the money, so having this uh, mm, assistance and, uh, and understanding from their side is, is a well-appreciated bonus. I think that's it uh, from my side. I, to, to go into the history of the project, is, uh, uh, it goes way too long. But uh, yeah, if you want to take something home from this presentation, it's that you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, in the Commission, we always speak rotten English, but everyone understands us <laughs> because it comes usually with money, <laughs> which is an advantage. So I appreciate it very much that you, both Edis and Janos talked about the importance of the Commission as well, which is very good. So our last speaker this evening is Thomas, who is from Acon Smart Grids. And this is a very interesting project as well, integrating the Czech and Slovak markets, but also bringing these modern digital tools to the front. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, <clears throat> our project, uh, Aiken, uh, is a bit different, I think, uh, compared to the project that were uh, discussed uh, discussed before. Just to give you a, a bit of spirit, what's the project uh, Aiken about? Also, the the acronym of the project Aiken it is not uh, it has not been chosen just uh, so by chance. It stands for uh, the uh, acronym of Again Connected Networks, or it could be also used as Again Connected Nations. The story behind this uh, is about the history of uh, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. As you might know, the two countries were, were one country together till 1993, when there was the so-called Velvet Revolution, and the two countries separated in a very uh, friendly and, uh, and very brotherhood uh, uh, mode. But uh, what happened in 1993 is uh, one of the unique things, I think, that uh, is existing uh, only between Slovakia and the Czech Republic, is that the two countries are still connected uh, also at the DSO level. So we are having effective and working uh, cross-border interconnection at the DSO level. 
And uh, the story uh, of the project Aiken is built uh, on this existing uh, connection on the DSO level. Uh, one thing uh, also compared to the size of the other project is the interesting thing that, as from my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the total electricity consumption of the two countries is presenting something roughly 3% of the European Union. So the countries are uh, very small, but I think the project itself is currently uh, the biggest smart grid project that is listed on the PCI list, and um, it is uh, having a, um, a different flavor compared to the uh, other projects. What are the, the learnings? I think uh, that all the PCI uh, project promoters have uh, done the same same route. I think uh, we uh, did the same uh, process of application to become a PCI, uh, to work as a PCI, to apply for, for a grant, and now we are entering the realization phase. But uh, what is different in the project Aiken, and uh, I would just uh, like to comment uh, the uh, the presentations before that, uh, luckily, uh, we did not have uh, any language barriers because uh, due to the common history, the Slovak and the Czech language are pretty much the same. I think we understand 99 or 100 percent uh, of, of the languages. So the discussions of the project team were very effective. We had, uh, we were talking in Slovak, the Czech colleagues were talking in Czech, and the application was written in English. So it was... <laughs> It was a very funny story, but uh, what I underline, and it was also said that it is very important to create uh, a common dictionary, so-called dictionary for the project, because uh, I agree uh, with the common language of the European Union, the bad English, and I think uh, all the, the, the technicians, the lawyers, the economists, they are using their own English or own, own terms, and it was very, very uh, important to, to know uh, what we are meaning when we are speaking about substations, about transformation stations, what is the meaning of our words we are saying in Slovak and the Czech colleagues are saying in, in Czech. Uh, but uh, foremost, I think, uh, and it's one of the uh, important, uh, important concept of a successful, if I may say so, a uh, successful PCI project is, uh, yes, to have a political uh, support from the member state is a crucial one. To have an understanding uh, from the regulator is, is a crucial one. To have uh, an active and effective communication towards the European institutions is definitely necessary. But uh, please allow me to say that I think that it's more important to have a dedicated internal team within the companies that will promote and push the project forward. Because uh, without having the dedicated uh, team, and in, in, in our case, it was kind of a pro bono activity of all the technicians and all the lawyers who worked on this project, because um, it, was, it was something new that uh, our companies were not, not facing, uh, facing before. And uh, one, one big learning is also, uh, I, would, I would mark it as the, uh, the, the, the courage or the courage to, to ask questions. Because uh, we could have our understanding on the Slovak side, the Czech colleagues could have their the understanding, but uh, at the end we need to find a common position. And how to find a common position? To ask the European Commission, uh, to ask uh, other successful uh, PCI projects, they could be also projects from, uh, from different uh, thematic areas, from the, the TSOs, uh, from, from gas or electricity, but to share the, um, the knowledge and then the intelligence that, uh, that we have gained uh, during this, uh, this past. Uh, as for the project, Aiken, the project is, uh, despite of the fact that the companies are very old, because our company was created in 1922, so we are just uh, approaching our uh, 100 years of, of anniversary, but the project is very young. The project idea itself, it was created in uh, 2016, the project was enlisted in uh, 2017. In uh, 2018, we uh, applied for, for a grant and we succeeded. And uh, now we are just uh, in, the, in the phase of, of realization. But uh, I would say that uh, a PCI project as a learning also for the company, an internal learning is that a PCI project is completely different from a, a business as usual project that the companies are, are running. The one big difference uh, from my perspective, uh, in our company I'm acting as uh, the head of the regulatory affairs, so I have quite a good, a good knowledge on, uh, on the regulatory issues. But uh, uh, one thing that is completely different is the, is the way how you are becoming a PCI, how you are promoting the project. Usually when a company, a distribution company, a national, national monopoly is willing to build a line or build a substation or transformation station, it's just uh, the negotiation between the company and the regulator. In case of a PCI project, you need to take into account also the opinion, also the position of your partner companies. You need to, uh, need to enter the process of application to become a PCI. It's not given uh, by definition that you will become a PCI once you apply to be a PCI. Then uh, once, you, uh, once you enter this, uh, I would say it as a, as a prestigious club uh, of, of the project in, uh, 
uh, in an amend terminology, it's kind of entering the, uh, the Champions League of, of, the, of the energy project, is then you need to apply uh, to for four grants. But uh, uh, there, has been, there has been so far a lot said about the, the application for the grant to receive the financial support. Of the of the commission, but I think that uh, there are also other support that you can see uh, for the administration of the project, the permit granting of the project, that are usually the bottlenecks of the grid project, at least in our region. But uh, I think that uh, you will prove that it's uh, it's also the situation in uh, in your countries. And um, then the big difference uh, and a big learning for us, a lesson learned for us uh, from this story is that usually. Uh, or at least uh, myself, I have never attended in Slovakia kind of uh, an energy project garden that are happening in Slovakia. So it's also the fact that you need to need to promote the project, you need to share the intelligence of the project, and uh, you need to need to invest also into the public consultations. You need to ask the public. Uh, you need to promote the projects either on web pages, on some uh, communication materials. This is also something different that the companies, uh, at least in, in our area, are just just learning. And uh, what is going to be the, the biggest delivery? Uh, the, uh, the reason that we enter the, uh, the PCI thematic area, we apply to become a PCI project, is, uh, is the change that uh, energy networks in Europe are just uh, going through now, and uh, uh, the changes that are going uh, that we are expecting in the near future. Also, in our region, we are witnessing the increasing share of uh, so-called uh, um, of, of the generation from, from renewable sources, the source of uh, generation that is more often from, uh, connected to the distribution grid. The new entries are just uh, coming to the market like aggregators, storages, uh, batteries. The customers are more keen about uh, the consumptions. And uh, I just said in, uh, in one of the conferences that from my perspective, uh, smart grid is really uh, a game changer for a distribution company. And this was the reason that we were entering because uh, from our perspective, it is uh, creating the situations when the lines are going to be turned on and the distribution company provider is just going to see what is happening really in the grid. And this is from our perspective, uh, just unlocking the potential for, uh, for efficiency in the grid, unlocking the potential how to use the grid and how, uh, how to manage the grid uh, uh, in, the, in the future. And uh, as for the benefits, uh, I think that uh, one of the biggest benefits of the projects is, uh, is to increase the, the energy security in, in our region, in the region where the project is going to be deployed, and uh, foremost to put uh, and uh, to bring some, some innovations, how uh, distribution grids uh, can be managed uh, uh, in, the, in the new conditions. And uh, maybe some, some last words on, on our project partners. Uh, the, the project is a, is a pure DSO project. The project is uh, involving investments only at the DSO level, but uh, for the fact that uh, we have also DSOs in Slovakia and Czech Republic, so we are also having them as a partner organizations. We have a, a memorandum of understandings uh, signed with them. They are just uh, uh, supporting the project, they are informed about the project, but the project itself is uh, going to be uh, deployed purely at the, the DSO level. So this is a very short introduction of the project ACAM. If you are interested to receive more details, I would very much invite you to visit our stand or our web page too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I thought we might have five minutes for questions and answers, but where, where is Katarina? Probably, ah, ah. Okay, for questions and answers. Okay, Let, let's have five minutes uh, just for questions and answers if anyone has anything and, and I have some ideas for wrapping up. Any questions? They're waiting for their drink. I can't see very well from here. No? Okay, well, from what I heard from all of you, it seems to me that there are a number of common factors for all of you. One is good cooperation from all the partners, that's clear. Uh, you have to trust each other and work together. Um, so the goodwill of all the partners, you all mentioned that. You mentioned also the importance of political support, stakeholders, contributions, that includes environmental and public uh, stakeholders as well, to make sure that the project has their agreement. You all mentioned, or at least most of you, and I'm sure you would have mentioned all this, the importance of the commission support, uh, political, technical, and the financial aspects, so I recognize that, that's very important. 
The other element is shared costs and shared benefits, so that there's no perception that one partner is taking advantage of the others. You all mentioned that, I think. Um, financing seems to help, so if you get additional financing, that's an added advantage. And of course, the legal framework and good governance seems to be a really important element to all these projects. So from what I heard from you, those seem to be some really important aspects. And of course, the regulatory framework uh, is another additional support and, and encouragement. Uh, so I think that from those points, we can see that you are on the right ground now to move forward. You know, we have an interconnection target of 15% now for 2030. So using those good examples from the projects here, this will help all of you in developing your future PCIs and continuing forward in the clean energy transition. So will you join me in thanking very much the panel for their contributions and wishing them the very best in finalizing their projects. Yes, and uh, don't go away yet, because next we have Dirk Beckers from INEA, who, I have it on my program. What are you going to do exactly, Dirk? <laughs> Here it is. Formal launch of the updated transparency platform for projects of common interest. So, Dirk, please, floor Thank yours. you. Thank you, Megan. Yes, I'm sorry that it's, I, I still keep you a bit from your drink, but I won't be very long, but I think it's useful to tell you a few words on the transparency platform. Uh, maybe first uh, to introduce myself, so I'm Derek Beckers. Uh, some of you know me already, but not everyone. I'm the director of the INEA agency, and we're uh, in charge of uh, managing quite some projects, if I can get maybe the next slide. So um, it's quite big, so I guess you can read it. So we're managing uh, the CEF and Horizon 2020, and we have four parent DGs, so we're working quite a lot with MOVE Research and uh, DGNR, of course, and, and, and CONNECT. We were managing the projects, and you can see if I limit myself to what interests you more probably on energy, is that uh, we are uh, up to 2019. We have already, or the CEF funding is supporting 102 studies, as you can see, and 29 actions, uh, works uh, linked to, uh, to, to the energy sector. And uh, there are 92 PCIs are concerned by, by this financing. But I'm not there to talk about uh, financing here, uh, but I'm to, I would like to have a few words with you on the transparency platform, which I think could contain some useful information for all of you on, on, on the PCIs. Now, the, the PCI, the transparency platform, is a public information system that provides data on the PCIs, including where they are located geographically, the implementation plans, and the financial support they get from the, the Commission. Um, it's uh, an obligation that comes from the, from the 10 year regulation which foresees that the transparency platform should be established. And so up until last year, this was uh, in the hands of uh, DGNR who was responsible for it, but who then uh, in common agreement, it was decided that the, the agency in here would take over the responsibility for this platform. Now, what does it platform do. It uh, compiles and provides information uh, that is delivered by the PCI promoters on the location of the PCI, so you will see in a second on the map, uh, a general information fish, which includes as well the funding that is given by, to the PCI, and then the implementation plan, which I guess is quite important to know the dates for the feasibility studies, the decisions, the final investment decisions, the permits, uh, commissioning dates, etc. So all of this is available now in this, in this platform. And what we do in the agency is based on the information we get from the, from the PCI promoters is to, to have a consistency check and to see, to look after the quality of the published data. So this, uh, on that basis, I, I think we can say that the platform is a transparent, updated and reliable source of information on all of the PCIs and gives quite some visibility on the development of the infrastructures and the actors involved in, in the process. Now, um, if I, on the next slide, please. So, um, where is the transparency platform? Because one thing is that I tell you what is on it, but I think it's more important that you know where you can find it 
and what you can do with it. So the, you can connect yourself to the transparency platform through our website. So if you go on the INEA website, you can, you can access the transparency platform. And this would be the, the first slide that you get. So uh, this is the general map where you can see the, all the ongoing infrastructure PCIs of the third list. Um, on the welcome page to the right, you can see a legend with all the sectors and the status covered by the transparency platform. Uh, on the menu icon, you can see the different options to tailor the information to what you would like to see. And so let's go a bit more in detail. If you go on the EU flag, which you see there, you, you see now we have selected all of them, but let's uh, select one of them. Let's indeed take Romania. So there you can see now all the, uh, the PCIs or all the cross-border infrastructure that is displayed. Uh, you have internal PCIs in Romania, but as well the ones that are linking with cross-border countries. In red, you have the, the gas ones, and in blue is the, the electricity PCIs that are being developed. And you can as well see the different type of infrastructure such, such as electricity and gas storage facilities and gas reference, gas reverse flow, sorry. Now, the information on, on each PCI, you can find in, in two ways. Or, or you click on the PCI line, which uh, for instance, we do now between France and Spain. And there you see the information on the, uh, on the PCI to the different information. Or you can type the PCI code if you know, for instance, you know the code of the PCI you want to look at, you type it, and then you get the, inform the same box where you can see then the information of the PCI fish, uh, but you can see there as well the link to the fish and to the implementation plan. For instance, if you click on the PCI fish link, then you get this P PDF document which shows you a detailed map with the location of the PCI, general information including promoters, countries involved, and the PCI website. Uh, you can see as well the technical information on the, on the PCI and the funding that is received uh, through uh, information on actions. Now, if we come back to our the PCI 2.7 that we referred to before, you can click as well the other thing that is available, the implementation plan. And there you can see uh, four boxes or four lines, uh, the PDF with the implementation status, the dates of the PCI implementation timeline, um, and the blocks that I mentioned about studies, final investment decisions, the estimated uh, permitting and constructing commissioning. So you see you have quite some, some documents, there's quite some information on each of the PCI is available over there. So in a nutshell, uh, I should say that uh, the transparency C platform gives you really quite a lot of information on, on all of the PCIs and where we are, where they are. Now we ensure the maintenance of the PCIs and we will do an update. We do it on a yearly basis. So we'll be doing now an update uh, towards the summer. We'll do a complete update of all of the, the different actions. And uh, of course, as I said before, if you want to see more information, you, can, you have the reference there of our website where you can find the necessary information on uh, what we just showed you. Or of course, you can contact our colleagues in C4 or you can have a word with me or the colleagues later on um, if you want to have some more information. Now, this update was quite a lot of uh, workload uh, for us, but as well for the PCI promoters. And so for those who are there, I would like to thank you again for the information that you have given us, which allowed us to, to make this uh, solid update. I promise to keep it short because I, it's getting thirsty in here, I guess. So. Uh, uh, I would like two things to invite you as well to visit the INEA stand, which is at the, when you go out to the, to, towards the end, where our colleagues can explain you some more things about what INEA is doing, but as well in particular, of course, on, on the, on the uh, transpar on transparency platform. And most of all, on behalf, I think, of DGNR, I would like to invite you to have a nice glass now and to enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.